Exodus 20, 20, 12. Honor your father and mother so that you may live a long life in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Yeah, I think that your parents were seeing if you stuttered over that. <laughs> you did good. Yes, yeah, so you may be seated. Let's do a little bit of praying as you're, you're um, getting ready. So right now, the most important thing is, is that we want you to hear from God. You got up, you got ready, you got to church. And so now, let's pray. So you take this opportunity, I'll help you. Let's do a little bit of praying. So God, we thank you for this day. God, thank you that we can come to your house with your people, worship, hear from you. So God, right now, just pray something like this. Open my spiritual eyes and ears. Can you pray that? God, I want to see and hear what you want me to see and hear. Encourage my heart where I need encouragement. Can you pray that? Convict me where I need conviction. Challenge me where I need to be challenged. So God, right now we pray that this time will come under your kingdom authority, reign and rule. We ask you to reign and rule over every aspect of what we're about to talk about right now. We pray that you stir our affections for you, O oh God, and that you just move among us right now. We pray this in Jesus' name. You agree with that? Say amen. amen. Look at this right here. Here is a quote. It says, youth today love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority, no respect for older people. They talk nonsense when they should work. Young people do not stand up any longer when adults enter the room. They contradict their parents, talk too much in company, guzzle their food, lay their legs on table, and tyrannize their elders. That was written by Socrates 400 years before <laughs> Jesus. There's <laughs> nothing has changed. Hmm. Okay, so now, this is another interesting thing right here. So the U.S. Center of Disease Control and Prevention reports that there are between 2 and 3 million people are living with leprosy-related disabilities globally today. That's kind of shocking to me that, that there's that much. Now, I don't really know a lot about leprosy, but one of the interesting things about it is that from what I understand, there's a disconnect between a person's brain and the rest of their body to where they can't feel pain. It's like someone with leprosy can make, put their hand on like a burner or something, their hand will be burning and they won't feel it. Their eyes don't, don't have the, the tendency to blink, and they'll have dirt and debris that'll get in there and they'll get infected. So there's all kinds of things, but one of the main things we'll talk about this morning is that disconnect where there's a numbness to where they can't feel pain, and that is a danger to the rest of their body because they're disconnected. Their body is disconnected from their head. So now whenever we talk about honoring father and mother, what we've got is we had a struggle. You go all the way back to 400 B.C., there's always been a struggle of this disconnect between the child and the parents. This, this family unit is so central to a healthy society that in the Ten Commandments, God puts that in. So this morning when I transitioned, we were talking about honoring God, the first four commandments, worshiping God, not having any other idols. And now it's a transition from that to how we treat one another. And in that transition, we've got the honor your father and your mother. Now here, let me just, let me start off this morning with a few things to preface all this. First of all, we're living in the day of grace. I don't want anything to come across as legalistic or anything like that. You got to do this before God's approval and all this kind of stuff because it can, when we go through the Ten Commandments, it can easily run into that. And that's not the, the heart of the gospel, okay? It's full of grace. And the other aspect of this is that some of you right now, you're bracing yourself because you're sitting, you're, you're sitting in your seat and you're thinking, man, David, if you only knew what I've had to put up with with my mom or my dad, and the Bible says that I'm to honor them, man, that's, that's a tough hurdle. That's an impossible hurdle for me to overcome. Okay, so listen, I want you to understand that I, I hear where you're coming from, and I want you to know that God has worked in and through all of this, and right now as you're sitting here, and you may be kind of bristling thinking, man, I don't know that I even want to hear this. Let me, let me just understand something. This is not about the way that we feel. If it's all based on the way that we feel, we would all end up in the ditch. This is based on the truth of God's word. So, I mean, if you're sitting here right now and you're like, I don't really believe that, that the Bible's in there and authoritative word of God, then you're about to have some problems. Just want to be honest with you. But if you're sitting here right now with me and you're like, hey, listen, I believe the Bible is the authoritative, inerrant word of God, then, <clears throat> then whatever it says, I'm going to be okay with that. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be working, and it's going to do what it needs to do. Did my microphone just go off? Because all of a sudden, it got really quiet in here. <laughs> Seems like all my batteries are up. Okay, 
Thought it might, whoa, I almost got to fix it right there, didn't I? 1950s, there was, these were the top te two television shows. I looked it up. Look it up for yourself. Top two television shows. This was Father Knows Best, which kind of tongue-in-cheek. He didn't really know best, but, I mean, it was just, he's, he is the center of the family. And then you got Leave it to Beaver. If you've, ever seen, if you've never watched any of those, you should go back and watch some of those. Here's the interesting thing about this. In the 1950s, you had, you had this is post-World War II America. You had the GI Bill came out, so all of the guys that have been fought in, the, in World War II, they came back home. The GI Bill enabled them to buy homes. There were, there were neighborhoods were going up all over the place, and there was, you know, the Industrial Revolution that are taking place. There were men going in the workplace and working, earning money, buying houses, buying cars, and they had expendable income for the first time in American history. The baby boomers were born. Families were going like crazy. When these neighborhoods were built, they built a neighborhood to where the, the front porch was the center of the house, and it was built with a sidewalk that went right down in front. I mean, like, it wouldn't be any much further than from here to, to the f f first two or rows right there. That would be the sidewalk, and the sidewalk would come right up to the front porch. The family would sit on the front porch, and they would communicate with all the neighbors that were walking by. It was all about community. The kids would go out into the neighborhood, and they would go out and play all day long with all the other kids in the neighborhood. That that was the culture of the 1950s whenever this was, whenever, I mean, the baby boomers and everything was going how it was back then. Then you go to the 1980s, and you know how father knows best. In the 1980s, you go watch those television shows, the dad's like the, this buffoon in the family that everybody makes fun of, and he's the idiot, and the mom's raising him along with the rest of the kids. So you see within 30 years, there's this massive shift that's taking place that's got us all the way to where we are today to where like there's this major breakdown in our understanding of the family to where like when you get into church and you say, we don't want to skip any of the commandments now, let's skip this one right here because we all got a problem with honoring father and mother today in our culture. You look at the culture you live in, you go turn on the television. You look at whatever it is. It is not about honoring the father and mother. Today is quite opposite of that. And so you may be sitting right now saying, man, David, listen, there's a good reason because the mom and dads in our culture, they have, okay, listen, listen, that doesn't matter. What matters, I'm telling you this, what matters is what the Bible says. If we, whenever we start moving away from the Bible, that's what gets us into the mess that we're into today. And if there is, listen, you, we don't have any control of what this culture out there is doing. All you have control over is how you respond to the word of God. So I'm just asking you today, right here and right now, are you willing to be convicted? Are you willing to be challenged? Are you willing to hear the word of God and say, okay, listen, I may not be 100% right, but I'm going to do my best to do what the Bible says. Here's what the Bible says. Every single one of us, man, those sweet little babies... We were all born as sinners. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me, and I was born a sinner. And then the Bible also says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us, born sinners. Born, I mean, we are born bent that way. So, hey, listen. It doesn't matter how good or how bad you think your parents were. They were not perfect. And here's what I can tell you, too. For you young families in here that you have young children, you are not perfect. I can remember one day that there was, a young, there was a man, he had young children. He came, and man, he was struggling over condemnation, and he was struggling over his sins. And he had a whole bunch of beautiful little kids. And I remember talking to him, and this was a long time ago. This was like 15 years ago. And I was like, man, listen, you don't expect all these kids to be perfect. I was trying to use that as an analogy that God wouldn't expect him to be perfect. I said, you don't expect all your kids to be perfect, do you? And he goes, yeah, pretty much. And I was like, ugh. Didn't know how to respond back. Here's what I can tell you. It wasn't just a few months, few months later, and that dude came unraveled. They had to come and arrest him in his home. He had some mental inst instability in his heart. And, I mean, I'm not saying that, that anybody that thinks that their kids should be perfect, they've got mental instability, but I'm telling you this much. The Bible says right here. So if you're expecting you to be perfect as a parent, or you're expecting your kids to be perfect, then you have got a huge expectation gap that's going to get crushed. Amen. Let me just go ahead. As long as we're going ahead and rolling it all out here, let me tell you this also, okay? So I have raised four children. My youngest child now is 19 years old. Oldest one is 36 years old. Here's what I can tell you. You young people in here today, you got young children. Right now, you're thinking 
oh, this kid right here is going to turn out like that. <laughs> Let me tell you something. The, you got, you got multiple kids. Man, these are the smart ones. They're going to do great. Let me tell you something. Yeah, there's people laughing in here for a reason. It doesn't always turn out that way. Okay, hey, let, me, let me just go ahead and throw one more thing out here because I see y'all paying attention. I'll get you while I got you, okay? <laughs> you can raise your kids in church. You can teach them the Bible. You can model for them exemplary Christianity, and they still can turn out like a hellion. Right. It's not, listen, it's not all contingent on you. God has given all of us a free will. And you can respond, and your children can respond. They choose the way they respond. And there's kids that have been raised in terrible atmospheres that have turned out to be some of the most godliest people I've ever known. So I'm not saying don't, don't, don't just go do what you want to do. It doesn't matter. You know, it's all up to them. No, I'm not. You know, it does matter, okay? But I'm telling you, some of y'all are carrying too big of a weight right now. And some of you, you've got adult children, and you've got a tremendous amount of guilt on you because the way your kids turned out, you think that's your fault. And I'm here to tell you today, there's something called Grace. There's something called mercy. And listen, before we all leave out here today, we all need to do some forgiving, by the way. May I tell you what? The Bible says this also, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. But you know this. But know this. Hard times will come in the last days. Here's what you have to understand. You are living in the last days. I'm not saying Jesus is coming back tomorrow. I grew up in church, and that was a message. Man, Jesus coming back tomorrow. You better get right. That's not what I'm saying. The time between Jesus' first the death, burial, and resurrection, his first coming and his second coming is considered in the Bible the last days. So you're living in the last days right now. Here's what it says. For people will be lovers of self. Do you see that in our culture today? Lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning. Look at that. Disobedient to parents, ungrateful, and unholy. So that's marks the day that we're saying, so don't be surprised. You know what I mean? Don't be surprised at what we see today in our culture. Okay, so as long as we're talking about what the Bible says, okay, <laughs> let's, talk, let's look at this. This is Deuteronomy. So this is right about the time the Ten Commandments came out, so they're getting ready to go live in their culture, okay, to be the new people that God created them to be. Here's what it says. If a man has a stubborn or rebellious son who does not obey his father or mother and doesn't listen to them even after they discipline him. So here, let me just understand this. Discipline is not punishment. Discipline is loving correction. So anytime you see discipline in the Bible, that means loving correction. His father and mother to take hold of him and bring him to the elders of his city, to the gate of his hometown. So that's where the, at the gate, that's, you have to understand something. At the gate, that's where the police station was. That's where the, the judge was, the jury, all the, everything took place at the gate, okay? All, all of it took place there, so. They will say to the elders of his city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He doesn't obey us. He's a glutton and a drunkard. So this is not a little kid, evidently. <laughs> I hope. Then all the men in the city will take him and take him to some psychological training. Doesn't say that, does it? Then Lord will sit down and give him a strong talking to. This swings all the way over to the other side. This right here, listen, in American Christianity today, we're not going to preach this, by the way. Because, man, this right here is highly offensive. This is why people don't go to church anymore, because this is so harsh. Okay, so listen, once, once again, I'll tell you, it is not my responsibility to defend God. He's God and I'm not. My responsibility is to show you the word of God. So this is what the Bible says. So the men in that city will then stone him to death. Man, you said, that's severe. I say, yes, it is severe. But the rebellion of the son is severe also. And you must purge the evil from you, and all Israel will hear about this and be afraid. So can you imagine the kid? I mean, you get the teenage boys that are right there, and they're, they're this is he started gang up. They get, they get a gang going. Man, they got, they got drugs and alcohol and all this kind of stuff. And then one of them gets disobedient to his parents, and they wake up the next day, and that dude's been wiped out by the elders. He got stoned by the elders. Do you not think that would have, you know what, I think I'm going to get out of this gang because I'd like to live. You see what I'm saying? And once, once again, I'm not trying to justify God. I'm trying to show you something here that, like, in our day, in our culture today, like, we are so, we are so scared of the Bible, man. I mean, it's like, man, we don't want to offend or hurt anybody's feelings. And then we got a culture that's so highly offended. I mean, like, if you say the wrong thing to somebody, they get offended. You go out there and you talk about Jesus in your culture and the world you live in today, and why do they get offended? Here's what the Bible also says. 
This is just going to get better. Don't worry. <laughs> Proverbs 30, 17 says, the eye that mocks it. So you ever had any teenage kids look at you funny, your parents? The eye that mocks a father and despises a mother's instruction will be plucked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by vultures. <laughs> you know, you're not going to see that on a birthday card, by the way. So here, I want you to understand also, so a, a prophet, a biblical prophet in the Old Testament, he represented the Word of God. So if you want to hear the Word of God, the prophet came in, and he gave them the Word of God. And I said, listen, today, today, okay, here you got, this is the Word of God, okay? So if someone says they're a prophet, that doesn't mean that they override the authority of this. This is the final authority right here, okay? So back during the days of the Bible, now the, the prophet, God would speak to him, the prophet would speak to people, he would tell them the Word of God. So how, you had to be careful back in that day how you treated the prophet because that's how you were treating the word of God. Look at this. So Elisha, he's one of the prophets, one of the big prophets in Israel's history. He left Jericho and he went to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, a group of boys from the town began mocking and making fun of him. Go away, Baldy, they chanted. Go away, Baldy. So it's not just that they were making fun of him for being bald. The one that represents the authoritative word of God, they're saying, get away from us. Get out of our town. Now listen, here, here. children are always indicative of the culture they've grown up in. Okay? When you got a group of kids and they have no respect for the authority of the prophet, that's indicative of the culture they've grown up in. It's going to get rough here now. Elijah turned around, he looked at them, and he cursed them in the name of Yahweh. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of them. That's a big group of kids right there, isn't it? I mean, once again, man, we see that, we're like, that is harsh. Okay, so I want to tell you something. You do realize something, that you live in one of the most softest, sensitive cultures in world history, right? Okay? I mean, like... So, I mean, I want you to understand something. I fully realize that this kind of stuff right here, I mean, if I sat down, if I went back to Bible college and I set this down, my preaching professor, I said, this is what I'm going to preach Sunday morning. He'd be like, dude, you're going to get fired. <laughs> Don't do that. But listen, I'll tell you something. My intention in here this morning is not to shock you. My intention this morning is not to be like, oh, wow, man, this is, this is all awesome and cool and everything. My intention for you this morning is to see a robust section of the Word of God and what it says about honoring God and about honoring our parents. This is so big that it made it into the Ten Commandments for a reason. So I mean, right now, some of you right now, some of you listen to it. I'm still not feeling it. You're making me feel worse right now. Just stick with me. You get all the way to the end. If you still feel worse, then we'll talk, okay? <sighs> Proverbs says this. So you kid, you know, you that have young children at home right now, look at, what this, look at what the Bible says. Don't fail to discipline your children. Loving correction. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. Don't fail to lovingly correct your children. The rod of punishment won't kill them. Physical discipline may well save them from death. <laughs> Real quiet in the church this morning. So I know when I was growing up, my, uh, my dad, whenever he got ready to discipline me, he would tell me to go pick out a belt. So I would go to this looming closet, and I would open up the closet, and he had look like a gazillion belts. And I would look for the softest one. And when it came time for Father's Day, and giving, I would go to the plate, and I'd be like, where's the softest belt? I want to get him the velvet soft belt, and I'll hang that dude up in there. <laughs> but I want to tell you something today. I mean, like, I would, I would say that, like, you know, when I talk about the way that I was disciplined, even to Melissa, she's like, man, that's kind of harsh, that's kind of rough. I am thankful for every, and I told her before, I am so grateful for every time that I was disciplined by my dad. And I mean, he probably would have gotten bad trouble today in this world we live in for the way he disciplined me back then. But I'll tell you something, I needed every drop of it, okay? And I'm thankful. So here we are, here's our text. And, the, and once, once again, man, it's the first word we've got to look at in here. Honor your father and your mother, both this unit right here, so that you may have, look at this, then it comes to the promise, so that you may have a long life in the land 
that Yahweh your Elohim is giving you. So this is about something that's like, okay, here they are on the Mount of God. God's telling them, okay, this is one of the most top 10, most important ones. But this is going to be something that's going to carry you over. When you cross over in the promised land, this is going to ensure that you are going to have a successful culture, family, unit all around. If you can just do this, this is going to help everybody, not just you. What does that honor mean? Kavod is the Hebrew word there. Honor, glory, and weight. So it means that you, so how, so have you ever felt like someone's taking your relationship with them lightly or too lightly? You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Because like if you, if you got, if you carry somebody's relationship, if they carry their relationship with you too lightly, then you're like, they blow you off. They don't really care. You know, they don't show up. They don't, they don't invest into it. They expect you to invest into it, but they don't bring anything back to the relationship. So what the Bible's saying here is that in your relationship with your parents, you are to have weight in this, that you are to, that you are to be vested in this. Now listen, stay with me. Some of y'all right now, listen, you've been abused. Okay, we're going to talk about that too. Here's what you have to understand. This right here is talking about how adults treat their parents. Let me show you what I mean. There's different seasons of honor. For a child, they honor their parents by obedience. Adolescents, it's respect. Adults, it's honor. So, this, you know, so I'm going to tell you about the culture I grew up in. The culture I grew up in, there's two rules that overruled every single one of the rules from my parents. Parents, it was this. Honesty, 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 and then respect. I mean, like, we, we all get along so it's just as long as you're on. So, that's just, so that thing hit me, I've carried it down to my children too. So this past week, it was my birthday, and on my birthday, my youngest son comes into the kitchen, and he has never bought me a birthday present, which is fine. I'm not real big on presents. You know, I tell my family all the time, don't buy me presents, don't care about presents. So he comes in, and he says, hey, Dad, what do you want me to give you for your birthday? And I said, the same thing you give me every year. Immediately he goes, oh, you're talking about honesty and respect. Because that's something I've drilled into their head. Like, this is, to me, that is the most important thing is that's how you honor me is through respect and honesty. So understand something that there's different seasons here. And whenever God's given the Ten Commandments to the nation of Israel, this is more about how all they, they treat their older, elderly parents that are getting older here too, okay, by honoring them. Because you look back in the, okay, before we get ahead, of that, on your outline, number one, Exodus 20, 12, there's a few things it doesn't say. It doesn't say, number one, it doesn't say, love your parents. It doesn't say, trust your parents. Some of you, you have been abused. Some of you, your parents, quite honestly, are not trustworthy. The Bible's not saying to love them. It isn't saying to trust them in Exodus 20, 12. It's not saying to admire them. Some of you, your parents have done things and lived lives and are still living today that's just not something that's admirable. And it doesn't even say in 2012 to obey your parents. Some of y'all right now, you know your Bible well enough to know, wait a second. Doesn't it say somewhere in there you're supposed to obey your parents? Okay, so who does it say? Some of y'all in here aren't children anymore. You may act like children, but you're not a child, okay? <laughs> this is for children to obey their parents. And look at this. And don't just say obey their, it's not just blindly. It doesn't just stop right there. Look at this. Obey your parents, what? In the Lord. So that, so our relationships are a two-way street. I mean, like, where's one of the problems with getting in church, especially for preachers, to get up there and say, oh, you got to obey your parents, you got to do all this kind of stuff. It says, in the Lord, if Listen, if you as a parent or if a parent is doing this to the child to where they are leading them away from the Lord, away from biblical principles, then they are not bound by the word of God to obey them. Okay? And they're teaching their kids to go out and do dishonest things and mean things or whatever it may be to go out and to hurt the rest of society. Then they're not in the Lord in that. Does that make sense this morning? Somebody say amen. Y'all are way too quiet, by the way. Help me out this morning. Matthew 22, 35 through 40. And one of them, an expert in the law, he asked a question to test him, talking to Jesus. Teacher, which commandment of the law is the greatest? Which one's the weightiest is what he's asking right here. Jesus said to him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. 
This is the greatest and most important commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law, the prophets depend. So like, we've already seen that. The first four were about, all about loving God. And now we get to this with your parents. And then the last are about all about loving your neighbor. So that made number two right there. Loving your neighbor, it starts at home. Man, I mean, listen, if, if, and I know, man, sometimes the home can be a rough place. Now, I totally understand that. I totally get that. So, but here's what it's saying right here. The Bible's saying this, that if I can't love the people in my own home, I'm going to struggle to love people outside my home. Here's what Augustine said. He's hit 300 to 400 years after Jesus. He said, he's one of the greatest theologians, I believe, in the New Testament, after the New Testament in our era. If anyone fails to honor his parents, is there anyone he will spare? I mean, I agree with that. I mean, like, if, we, if I can't honor my parents, then listen, I'm going to have a hard time with police out there. I'm going to have a hard time with my teachers. I'm going to have a hard time with anybody in authority. Over, I'm not going to want to answer to anybody. So do you see? Now, listen, I want to tell you something. Man, this structure right here, it's like marriage. If you've got... If you've got one person in the marriage that's following Jesus and going towards the seeking the kingdom of God, and you've got another person that's seeking the world and living for themselves, they're going to have a hard time. That's going to be a broken marriage. It's going to be suffering. It may not survive. But if you've got two people that are going the same direction, you young people that haven't gotten married yet, this is the most important aspect of marriage. You've got two people spiritually going the same direction, then you're still going to have hard times. You're still going to have trouble. You're still going to have arguments, but you're moving the same direction. When you're moving, you're seeking the kingdom of God first, you're moving the same direction, then all of that stuff is going to work out in time. You will stick with it. But you've got two different directions. That's when it's dangerous. Number three, you honor your parents by forgiving them. So some of you, your parents have done some unforgivable things to you. I want you to know this morning that I get that. Because there's some terrible, horrible things that have been done to some of you that are sitting in here, some of you that are watching at home, some of you that will be listening to this later. I totally get that and I totally understand that. But here's what you have to understand. When you forgive someone, you set yourself free. This isn't about the way you feel, and it isn't about what the person deserves. It's about what you deserve. God has got grace for you, and he wants to fill your heart with grace. And the only way he can fill your heart with grace is if you will allow him to let you forgive them and to forgive yourself. So listen, so, you know, I want to tell you this again. I said this a hundred times, and I'll say it again. We got to pray, God, grant me the ability to forgive and fill in the blank. Because in my own power, I cannot forgive them. It's going to take your supernatural power of the Holy Spirit in me to have the ability to ever forgive them. Then let me ask you a question. Do you believe he can do that? Do you believe he is able to do that in your heart? Look at this. Here's what the Bible says about forgiving. For if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, don't just say the ones that deserve it. Listen, doesn't say only the people that come and ask for forgiveness. I've sat in church and heard that stupid argument before. It doesn't say only people that No, you should only forgive people that. No, it does not say that. It says forgive everybody. It says, look at this. Others, their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not. You say, well, David, what about all that grace you talk about? Man, I thought that God's full of grace and everything like this. Because when you stay in perpetual sin, you cannot stay perpetually forgiven. So it's not about God being able to forgive you or God's grace being over your life or anything like that. The fact is that whenever I stay in anger and unforgiveness towards someone, I'm staying in sin. When I stay in sin, it isn't about God's ability to forgive me. It's that I don't want to be forgiven. I don't want out. I want to stay in this hate. I want to stay in this anger. I want to hurt them back for hurting me. And here's what happens. All you do is hurt yourself. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another. Oh, church, come on now. You do see that nobody's perfect, right? See, listen, some of y'all, y'all get so agitated because everybody around you don't act right. Let me tell you something. It's kind of hard to deal with you sometimes, too. 
That's not the way I can put it. All right? None of us are perfect. You got to stop thinking about that. Now, you may feel like the people around you, but it's a struggle to be put up with them. Sometimes you're a struggle too. We gotta, so I'm a struggle too sometimes. I, got my, I get along with myself real good, but other people don't. <laughs> Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has grievance against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also are to forgive. Pursue peace with everyone. Are you, are you with me this morning? Say amen if you're with me. Because here's the most important verse I'm going to show you this morning. Pursue peace with everyone. Are you doing that right now? Are you mad at somebody right now and you want to get back at them? You want to hurt them? Are you rebelling because you're trying to hurt your adult parent? You as an adult, are you rebelling today because you're still trying to hurt your daddy? Pursue peace with everyone. And holiness means to be set apart. Without it, no one will see the Lord. So I'm going to get my question for you today is you want to see the Lord? Yeah, I mean, like you can see him. In every aspect of your life, you can live that kind of life today. Not physically seeing him, but spiritually experiencing his presence and power in your life. Then make sure that no one falls short. How much grace do you want? How much grace do you need in your life today? Here's what I can tell you right now. Listen, listen, don't miss this. Your receiving grace is not because God doesn't have enough. The amount of humility you got in your life... That's the amount of grace that you can receive. It's up to you. You got less humility, guess what you're going to get? You're going to experience less grace. You got more humility, you're going to experience more grace. So right here, he's saying make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness. Oh, man. That root of, you know, that root of bitterness, it doesn't need any nurturing. It will grow on its own. You can just, it's like weed, man. You're like, you don't have to go out there and cultivate the weeds in your garden, do you? I mean, if you want to have a good, healthy garden, a good, healthy yard, that means you got to invest, put money into it. you got to work on that thing all the time. Or if you got a swimming pool, you want to keep that pool clean? Oh, my goodness. That thing's got to be worked on all the time. So you got to be working all the time on your soul to make sure that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble. And look at that. Defiling everybody around you. So I'm telling you, listen, if you got unforgiveness and bitterness in your heart today, here's what I want to tell you. It is not just hurting you. It is hurting the people you love the most around you. That root of bitterness does not stay in you. It grows and it grows and it grows until it, until it just explodes out on all the people around you. So why do you need to forgive? You need to forgive so you'll be at peace. And then when you're at peace, and guess what? You're at peace with God and you're at peace with the people around you. And that stuff is not spewing out of you on them all the time. Honoring others. Notice what I said. Look at that outline very carefully, my friend. This is everybody now. Not just your parents. Honoring others. It's a commitment to God. Because I can't do this in and of myself. i got to have God help me with this. It's a commitment to God to uphold a relationship based on respect, gratitude, and understanding. There are some people in my life that I've got to respect. And I can show gratitude and I can be understanding from a distance. Are you with me this morning? Because there's some people in my past who have done things to me that were wrong, and they might have even been abusive, I don't know. But I know this much, that I've had to separate myself from them. I've had to forgive them, and I've had to break soul ties with them. <laughs> I grew up in church and nobody ever said that word, soul tie. That was never part of my culture. i never forget, I was getting ready to um, speak to the, the students on, on a Wednesday night, and I thought, I'm going I'm to preach to them about soul ties, because I thought I knew what soul ties were. I had no clue what soul ties were. Man, the Holy Spirit just snuck up on me and got me on this one. I, um, John Eldridge, Wild at Heart, you got that out? You get that? Have you heard of him? If you haven't, man, check that dude out. So like, I came across, I didn't know him, I came across a podcast that said Breaking Soul Ties. I listened to his podcast and it unraveled me. Okay, let, okay so I've got to tell you this, okay? So in my early 20s, I worked for someone and it, it might have been abusive, I don't know. But here's what I can know, even if it wasn't. Every week, at least two nights a week, I worked for that person all night long in my dreams. I'll wake up in the morning and just be, come out and just be like, what's wrong with you? And I'll be like, oh, I worked for him. I'd say his name all night last night. Never could shake it. Man, God, I forgive him, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I, I just, I felt like God had forgiven me. When I listened to that podcast, 
And he showed the little prayer about breaking soul ties. And I was like, oh, maybe I need to break soul ties with that person. I've already forgiven them, but I need to break. So I did that. I prayed the prayer. And you know what? That was three, four years ago. I never worked for him again. There's never been another one of those dreams. So I want to tell you something. See, some of you right now, you, you go check that out. John Eldridge, Wild Heart app. Look at the Breaking Soul Ties. That has been something that, that's, that has helped me so much in the last few years. Of Whenever I hit in a, a confrontation with a person or just, they're, you know, just have ugly stuff that happens between me and them, just to walk away and break soul ties and be set free from their stuff. Now, some of y'all right now, y'all are like, Man, that is just weird. Okay, so it is. I'll give you that. But I'll tell you something. I wish somebody would have told me this years ago. And I could have checked that out for myself because some of you are going to find some freedom just by doing that. Respect, gratitude, and understanding. Because, listen, if you really want God to help you understand why they treated you like they've treated you, why they're treating you like you, they treat you, he will show you. But you can't be angry about it. If you're angry about it, you won't get it. So let's talk about this tree right here. This tree, the foundation of this tree for you and your parents, okay? If your parents are still alive, let's talk about this for a moment. The foundation of your relationship with them has got to be honor. The wind comes and blows, the storms hit. Honor does not be, it's never shaken, it never changes. Honor is not based on the way that I feel. Honor is about looking at this relationship, saying, okay, it's got weight to this relationship. I want to show honor to my mom or my dad or to both. I want to give them honor any way I possibly can because at the top up here, you've got trust, dignity, obedience, love, forgiveness, affection. These are all the limbs. These limbs can break. Storms can cause them to break. They can fall down. You can, I mean, these are all based on circumstances and the way that you feel. This right here is based on the word of God, the truth in that that you have got to do for you to be healthy, to honor them, to wait to that, to forgive them. Doesn't mean if they're abusing you, come back in and let them abuse you more. It means that you honor them from a distance. Doesn't mean even if they've died and they passed on and they're gone, but they abuse you. Doesn't mean that, that you have to do anything to stir back up those terrible feelings, but you honor them from a distance. <clears throat> okay, so, man, we are blessed with a whole bunch of young families in here. Y'all got the little cute kids and everything? Got something for you this morning, okay? Ephesians, we're looking at a while ago with the children obeying their parents. Then it comes down to verse 4, and it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the loving correction, the discipline, and the instruction of the Lord. So let's talk about something this morning before we head out of here. Five, this is number five on the outline. This isn't five ways. There's about eight of them right here. And there's even more than this. This is not an exhaustive list. But here are some ways that parents uproot honor. And I'll say this too, that these are ways that we uproot honor with other people that we want to love and respect us. Maybe, maybe you got people that work for you or whatever it may be. This is how you uproot honor in that life. So if you want people to honor you, then here's the way that you uproot that, by hurtful words. That's that unforgiveness in us that other people have hurt us, and we're spewing it out on the other people, the innocent people around us that we love. Excessive punishment. When we go from loving discipline to punishing out of anger to get them, we're uprooting honor. Neglecting basic needs. And those basic needs are not just physical, those are emotional needs as well. And then setting bad examples. I mean, I would, I would venture to say that that story about Elisha, whenever those, that group of young boys came out there and they were doing all that, I would venture to say that those young boys had bad examples set for them about the word of God and about respecting the um, prophet. Thank you. Unreasonable demands. <laughs> I know some of y'all right now, you're thinking, man, some of y'all older folks, man, you grew up with, un it seemed like, you know, the, the way that you were made to work and stuff like that, those were unreasonable demands. But I mean, unreasonable, like expecting your kids to be perfect. You know, like expecting them to be everything that you wanted to be. You know, like you wanted to be the top athlete, the top student, and, all, and you expect them to be that because you want to live your life through them. Hey, listen, let me ask you something. Is it okay if your kids don't play sports? Yes. Is it okay if they come to you and say, yeah, you know, I'm not going to make it the NBA, Dad, and I just I don't want to play this year. Is it okay with you? 
Never forget whenever my, uh, one of my boys, whenever he got into high school, he played basketball. I was just coaching as a peewee and all that. And he came to me his junior year, and he said, Dad, please, please don't be mad at me, but I don't want to play basketball. I was like, good. He was shocked. I almost fell over. I said, then don't play. If you're not having fun, then don't play. That's the, our identity is not wrapped up in basketball, man. Do what you want to do. I'm not living my life through you, okay? Lack of encouragement. Man, my dad never encouraged me. Okay, maybe he didn't. But I want to tell you once again, the words that you speak to your children are ten times more impactful than any words anybody else ever says. Dads, your sons need to hear you say, I love you and I'm proud of you. That's a need that they've got in their heart. You may not think they need that. You may not, that's not, that's not me, doesn't matter. That's what you, you really want to have honor. You want one of these days, whenever they're adults, to come back to you and sit down and say, hey, Dad, I need some advice. Then that's what you do today. And I don't make them into hard, tough men. <laughs> well, you may be uprooting honor. And don't dismiss their feelings. Hey, listen, I want to tell you something. I'm, I'm just as bad as anybody at this. When I hurt somebody's feelings, and they come to me and they say, David, man, what you just said hurt my feelings. I know it's probably shocking you to hurt people's feelings by what I say, but sometimes it happens. And they come to me and they say, David, man, that hurt my feelings. Well, why did it hurt your feelings? They tell me, well, that's not what I meant. Okay, so here's what I've learned. It doesn't matter what I meant. What matters is what they heard and what they felt. Okay? And if I can stop, step back for a moment and not try to justify myself and be like, that's not what I meant. And I can, I can understand, seek first to understand them. They understand that, hey, this is where it all spun out on us right here. So I wanna, I wanna, I don't, we don't ever want to dismiss someone's feelings and then lack of prayer. The most important thing that you can do, your relationship with your children, is to pray over them. And I'll, listen, I'll come back to you dads once again. You may, listen, if you're counting on your wife to do all the praying, I don't have anything nice to say right now, so I'm just going to keep shut up. You need to be praying. Listen, you are the patriarch of the family. You are called to be the leader of the family. You are the one that's got to step up and pray. So I was, I was, I was raised in a, all the women are clapping, the men are like, oh, just stayed home today. So, I, you know, I was raised, the, the family that I was raised in, you know, my, I never remember my parents going to church as a kid. I always went to church with my grandparents. And, like, so um, my dad, when I was 11 years old, he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. He had to retire. I, I can remember as I was a little bitty kid, um, my family was always farmers. I can remember going out into the, on the family farm as a little bitty kid. And, man, my dad, my grandparents, all my siblings were all worked the farm until I was 11. And then it drastically changed. And then when I was 14, the older brother next to me up in years was killed in a car accident, drunk driving. And that even changed the family dynamic even more. And so then a few years later than that, um, when I was 21 years old, my dad had congestive heart failure. He, um, he, he died at the hospital. They brought him back and they, 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 they came to us and they said, we've done all we can do and he's not gonna live. And so my dad said, I just want to go home. I don't want to die here. So we, we took him home. And so we took him home, and he's, he's in the bedroom. And, like, I never had talked. My dad never talked. He never prayed with me, never talked to me about God. And I was concerned. I never forget, here I am, 21 years old. And I, I, at this point, was in church every Sunday, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Man, I was, God was moving in my life. And I went in there, and I, was, and I was going to ask my dad if he was saved. I never will forget, walked up there to his bed. And looked at him and I said, hey, Dad, I got a question for you. And there was like rocks in my throat. I could talk to, and I talk to people about this all the time, but not my family. And it was a rock. And I was just like, just like, oh, just, it was like one of the most painful things for me to get that initial, break that initial ice with him. And we did. He lived another 10 years, by the way. We talked about it many times. The last conversation I had was by his bed talking about his salvation. So, feel good about it today. But the reason I'm telling you that story is because some of you men never breach that subject with your children. Listen, that's your responsibility to talk to them about that. 
so they know where you stand and they know how important that is in your life for them. Even if it's not that important to you, you need to express it to them. The earlier you start, the easier it's going to be. If you've got little bitty children, pray with them today. Teach them how to pray. Thank God I had a grandfather taught me how to pray. Thank God I had a grandfather walk into the room and he'd have his Bible open. I walk over and I say, Granddad, what you reading? Oh, son, let me tell you. Thank God for that. Listen, you be that man. You don't rely on someone else. You want to be the man? That's how you be the man. King David had two sons, Old Testament. Two sons that were very different. One of them was named Absalom, the other one was named Solomon. Absalom, he rebelled against David. Listen, David, <laughs> biblical characters, man, I mean, you look, okay, so you got the big biblical characters of the Old Testament, all right? Abraham, Moses, and David. David was, man, that dude was messed up at times. So sometimes he's on fire for God, and there's sometimes he's making a wreck of life. And, and his, his kids, man, I mean, like, he had trouble with his kids. I mean, like, I can't tell you this story that happened because it's not even PG-13 that got Absalom to rebel against his dad. Put it to you this way. His brother did something terrible to his sister, okay? So Absalom got mad, and he had his brother executed. And then he rebelled against David, and he decided that he's going to be king and he got a military up together to go fight against his own dad. Absalom, the Bible says, was a handsome man's man, strong, big, muscular, long hair. He goes into the battle. Let me tell you something. You got to understand something. You cannot go around the providence of God. It was not God's will for him to be king. It was God's will for Solomon to be king. He tries to take it by force. And when he does, when he's in the military fight, he comes under a tree, and that beautiful long hair of his gets hung up in the limbs of that tree, and he hangs from the tree. And Joab, the commander of David's army, runs a spear through him and executes him. He dies a gruesome death. Solomon, he wasn't so great at times either, but he started out, he loved his dad. He respected his dad. He honored his dad. He became king of Israel, and the whole nation of Israel saw more peace under the reign of Solomon than it did in the other king. It prospered more. And here I say, listen, was Solomon messed up? At times he was. But this, my whole point in this, Absalom rebelled against his dad. Solomon honored his dad. Two total different men, total different outcomes. So let me show you one more verse. Love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Have you got brothers and sisters in Christ? Say amen if you do. Amen. Here's what it says. Love one another, not just when you want to, when you've wanted. It says deeply. So you got to work on that, man. you got to invest in that. Take the lead in honoring one another. Your responsibility is to take the lead in honoring one another. So not just honoring your parents, but to honor everybody. To hold weight to every relationship in Christ Jesus. That is your responsibility. So how do you honor people? We saw it a while ago. Respect, understanding, and maybe sometimes that is from a distance, but we honor them. Do you know how we dishonor people? When we gossip about them, talk bad about them, and run them down behind their back. So wouldn't it be great if all of us only said about other people what we say to their face behind their backs? I'd love to go to church like that. We're like, I would never, no one ever says anybody, if they're going to say it, then they're going to say it to your face. Behind your back, the same thing they say that they say to your face. Wouldn't that be wonderful to go to church like that? There isn't one that exists, by the way, but I would love to go to one. So that's one thing I want to encourage you to do, too, is that anytime that you're going to talk about someone behind their back, try not to say anything that you wouldn't say if they were right there and you were, they were in your presence listening to what you say. Because here's what I can tell you, in the little, in the little, this is going to be shocking to y'all that live in a little community. It's going to get back to them anyway. <laughs> one way or another, it's going to get, you know, that person that you trust in so much, it's going to get back one way or another. So many times it does. Y'all glad y'all came to church this morning? Yeah. I am sweating up here. Let's stand.
So if you've got parents that, for you adults, if you have a mom or dad that's, um, that has done anything that you can look back at and say, you know what, they did a lot of things wrong, but I'm glad they did this. So I've, I've, my mother, she lives with us, and I went to her many times, and I went to her and I said, Mom, you know, I'm so thankful that the number one thing that you taught me was to be honest. That has paid off so many times in my life, and so thank you for teaching me that. So is there anything, if you've got a living parent, that you can think of that you could be like, you know, I'm thankful for that. I saw that, and that made a difference in my life. Then you know what you can do? You can honor that parent today. Maybe, maybe you get rocks in your throat when you try to say nice things to them. Maybe you could write it down and give it to them. But it, and see, here's the thing, is that when you honor them, you're honoring God. It's just that simple. So we're not, it's not suggested that we honor them. It's commanded. So maybe for you also, then maybe there's been men or women in your life that they, that weren't really your biological mom or dad, but they raised you that way. And you're thankful today for what they, the investment they made in your life. Then I would encourage you to do the same thing. Honor them today. Let them know what a difference that they made in your life and that you've got gratitude towards them and you're thankful to them. Maybe there's people, spiritual leaders in your church or from your past in church that are still alive. I encourage you to do the same thing. So think about what God is calling you to. What season of life are you in today? And here's what I want to ask you to do. If you've got children that didn't hear this sermon, and you're thinking, they need to hear that. Listen, I would ask you not to do that. I mean, in, in all seriousness. Because whenever you do that, the agenda is made crystal clear. So here's what I would tell you to do. Or I would advise you or encourage you to do, not tell you. I would encourage you to do this. Think about the ways that you can live a life of honor before them from here on. Okay? So let's pray a little bit. See, because some of you in here, you have adult children, and you've been carrying a weight of unforgiving yourself because you feel like you failed them. So right now, why don't you just bring that to the Lord in prayer? So maybe you need to pray something like this, God, Am I seeing this correctly? Did I fail my children here? Maybe for some of you, you need to go to your adult children and ask them to forgive you for some of the things that you've done. You might be surprised at the response you get. So then for you that are adults, I'm still talking to you. So this, let's pray about this honoring our parents. So God, just pray something like this. Holy Spirit, what can I do today in a healthy relationship with my father or my mother that today I can show them honor? So maybe you need to pray something like this. God, I, I pray that you give me the ability to forgive my dad or to forgive my mom. That you teach me how to break loose all the soul ties that are tangled up that are wrecking out my heart today. Can you pray something like that? God, today we are thankful for grace. 
We're thankful, God, that when we come to you and we ask for forgiveness, that you forgive us. And God, we pray that you would help us to freely forgive everyone, to be set free from that bondage of unforgiveness. So don't you look up here at the screen one more time before we take communion this morning? So I want to ask you a question. How deeply does Jesus love you? The Bible says that no one's ever loved you like that. They laid down his life for you. Lived the perfect life. They laid down the cross in your place. Substituted for you. Sacrificial lamb. That's love. So as you consider that this morning, let's be so thankful today for the grace of God. Because we, we take communion, it's all about remembering that unconditional love and grace that God's poured onto us through Jesus Christ. That's what communion is all about. So thankful for that today. Jesus makes every wrong right, and he will in the end. Do you believe that today? So let's take communion. So, we've, so come up to the front or to the back. We've got elements all over the place. Take your time, no big hurry. You know, I'll be interested to see what the most read book in the New Testament is. I would think, just from my experience, talking to people that don't really read the Bible, it might be Revelation, the book of Revelation. It's an intriguing book. You know, even people that don't believe in God read it, and it's fascinating to them. It, it tells us of not only the future events that are going to take place, but it also tells us about what's happening in heaven right now. So right now, it tells us about the worship service that's taking place in heaven. So, I mean, I know, I know there's a whole lot of people that are like, man, they don't, they, if, they like, if heaven is like church and I don't want to go to heaven, man, that is boring and painful, you know. We're just going to tell you, heaven is beyond what we could ever imagine. No church service on the face of this earth can even compare what heaven's going to be like. I say, well, how do you know, David, you've never been there? Well, I've read about it. It's in the book of Revelation. And look, look at what it says right here. It says that whenever the living creatures, they give glory. What's that word right there? Look at that. So, I mean, like, that's, this is an expression of our worship to Jesus. When the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks, there it is gratitude to the one seated on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before the one seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne. They say, our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory. And there it is again, and honor and power because you have created all things and by your will, they will exist and were created. So every single one of the hurts that you have experienced in this life, if you're positioned in Christ Jesus, here's the promise that you've got. That when it's all said and done, when it's all wrapped up in the end, that Jesus is going to make every wrong right. So right now here today, you still feel the pain. You still suffer the consequences. 
You still go through all of that. But I got to ask you something today. Are you positioned in Christ Jesus? Is that where you're positioned? If you're in Christ Jesus, that means the blood of the Lamb is over your life. That means the wrath of God is passing over you. You're under the mercy and the grace of the Lamb. And I show you all this every week because it's essential. Because now there's no condemnation for those that are positioned in Christ Jesus. And that's why we can take this. That's why we can come to him today and we come to his table and we sit down in this sacred moment right here as God's people. We sit across the table from Jesus and we say, I remember. I'm doing this as an act of remembering what you've done for me. That it's not because of my performance, but it's because of my position in you, because of what you did for me that I couldn't do for myself. Man, I made a wreck of things. But even in the midst of making a wreck of things, God did something beautiful. So today, you listen, don't walk out of here today under a load of condemnation and guilt. Regardless of what's happened to you from your parents, regardless of what you've done or haven't done as a parent, don't walk out of here. Listen, if you're in Christ, there's no reason for you to walk out of here under condemnation. Maybe conviction, but not condemnation. Conviction leads us to repentance and to peace. So are you in Christ today? That means you're fully forgiven if you're in Christ today. That's what that means. That means that now, because of that forgiveness, we can approach him and we can say, thank you. And that's what we're doing now in this moment. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this as an act of remembrance of me. So that's what we do today is we open up. Let's take out that wafer. Right now, we are remembering. We are remembering the body of Christ. Here in this moment, we are remembering that through that sacrificial death that we are totally 100% forgiven. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for the atoning blood of Jesus. Are you thankful for that today? Are you thankful for your position in Jesus? Let's remember that today. So if you want to, you can pray with me. There's power in our prayer when we pray it out loud. So I'd encourage you to do that. Let's say, dear Jesus. Thank you for your body. Thank you for forgiving me. You're my God. You're my King. You're my Lord. And you're my Savior. Let's eat. Take your time. Think about what you're doing right now. The most sacred moment of your day, don't rush through it. Looking back at the screen, if you would, please, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So let's go ahead and open up to the juice. So the lamb that was slain with the foundation of the earth, the, the, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That's a lot. One drop, take away the whole sin, whole world, everybody past, everybody present, everybody future. That's power in that blood right there. So this, this juice that, we're, that you're holding right now, it represents that life-giving power. And it's interesting that, that this is the, what God wants us to do, the thing that, that gives us life, eating and drinking. We have to do that to live. And here we are eating and drinking in communion with the Lord, remembering him, where we're remembering the life that he has given us, eternal life that will never, ever come to an end. So would you pray with me if you want to? Dear Jesus, thank you for the new covenant. Thank you for your blood. You're my God. You're my King. You're my Lord. And you're my Savior. Let's drink in faith.
So we're ending our service a little bit different than we usually do. Um, so I will come back up here in just a moment, and I'll close us out. We're going to, we're going to, this is a, you know, we're starting up school. And man, can y'all believe the summer is coming to an end? It's 110 degrees, but it's coming to an end. Thank the Lord. And they're starting, school starting back up. And so with all these things, it's a, you know, on, in church, it's like starting a new um, fiscal year for us, if you will. And so all of our ministries are kicking back off again. Um, so, you know, our desire for you to really fully experience what it means to be a part of the body of Christ here in our church is to be part of a community group. In that, that's, that's I mean, like here, yeah, so you can come, worship, music, preaching, prayer, but that's where the fellowship takes place. That's an essential part. If you get to know people, people get in to know you. So it's time to kick off our community group ministry once again. And so we have got a video, and I think we've got a video. They told me they got a video, so if they don't, then I'll be coming right back. Hey, guys. My name is Kyle Jones. This is my wife, Pat. We're going to talk to you guys today about community groups. Um, when we first started uh, here at the bridge, the decision was made not to do the traditional Sunday school, but to do community groups in people's homes or up here at the church. Uh, having grown up in church that had always had Sunday school, this was something totally new. But Pat, you can share a little bit about how that works for you guys. And well, basically a community group is a group that comes together to do life together. We um, usually meet after the service, but some meet on different days of the week. And you come together, you discuss the message that David has, um, has taught. You go a lot deeper uh, with each other. You share some personal things. But the great thing about it is you don't have to. If you don't feel comfortable, you don't have to do that. Usually we have a meal together, but not all community groups do. And then um, you, we usually have prayer afterwards. So we're one of many of uh, community groups at the bridge. Some have uh, child care available, some do not. Uh, it's usually all different ages from, we've had it from uh, single students all the way up to people in their 70s. Mm -hmm. And so I think that really keeps the generations together. Um, and it is both men and women. And the way that the community groups operate is we try in each one of them to uh, follow the same format. Uh, most of them have meals, as Pat said, but not all of them do. But they all have time of fellowship. They have time of uh, going over the application questions. David or whomever the uh, teacher is that day will give us five to six questions, and then we throw that out uh, to the group to see how we can apply what we just heard during the service today. We've also had activities outside of the actual uh, time that we meet together as a community group. We've done fellowships together. We've gone bowling together. Um, you know, when you talk about doing life together, we've done things such as all the way from baby showers to weddings to gone to funerals together or even served um, here at the church for one of our people in our community group that um, had to go through that. Yeah, so the, the big thing is to staying connected. Uh, we, we highly encourage that. It's, it's part of the DNA at the bridge. So much of our ministry goes through the community groups. And so we just encourage you to, if, you're, if you haven't gone to one, we encourage you to do that. Um, and if, if you don't find that as the, the right fit in that group, there's many, many more that you can try. And we encourage you to do that. Just keep trying. I know that um, I've told Kyle before, I've gone to church uh, at a time in my life and felt um, alone, even though I knew people within the church and I had friends within the church. But what I was missing was that connection of outside the church and, and like I said, like we shared, of doing life together. So if you go to one, it's not the best fit for you, go to another one. Talk about uh, your, the text that you guys have a text thread that keeps everyone connected throughout the week. We do. Sometimes we share a prayer request or just what's going on. Um, usually I, I'll text out about the meal, what we're going to have, and everybody contributes and they'll tell me or whether or not they can come or not just so that we can plan on numbers. But it's another way just to stay connected. So again, if, if you haven't 
try the community group, we strongly encourage you to. And um, we think you'll like it. We know that this is how you will find connection. And at the end of the day, that's really what a lot of people are looking for and to go deeper into God's Word. And we think this is the perfect way. Amen. Would you please stand this morning? So Kyle, as you saw there, he, um, today he leads up our um, security team. So if you're interested in being a part of the security team, uh, man, there's a whole bunch of them back behind this window here. They've got computers in there, and they're watching stuff all around. So there's all kinds of things and ways that you could help the security team. So they're going to meet here today at 3 o'clock. So if you're interested, you, know, you might want to give that a try today at 3 o'clock. Come up here and join them. And they would love to have you. So I'm going to close this out in a word of prayer. And I got one more thing to ask you after I pray, okay? So God, we thank you today. We thank you for grace. God, we thank you for church family. God, we thank you that for some that have grown up in environments that were harsh, we're thankful, God, for the church family where they can come and find people to love them and to express the love of Christ and to show them the love of the Heavenly Father. So we're grateful for that. We're grateful for community, our community groups. And God, so I just pray right now, if there's anybody here today that, that just kind of stirred in their heart that today that they would they'd find one today, that they would just go give one a try. And so God, we are, we are grateful. And so I just pray, God, I want to pray over all the men, all the dads in here right now, God, I pray for them. I pray that you would just stir something supernatural in them right here as they leave out of this place. God, that you would just show them what it means to be a kingdom man, what it means to, to lead their children and their wives. And God, I pray for the, for the moms here as they leave out, that you would stir in them a supernatural nurturing and love for their children that only a mother has. And God, we just pray that as we work through these complicated relationships here on earth. God, we're thankful you've given us grace, and we pray, God, that you would help us to show grace to others. So as you leave out here today, remember, i got one more thing for you, but let me pray this over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace in all your relationships. All right, so here's what I need you to do. Before you leave out of here today, one thing I want to ask from you. That chair that you sat in, if you wouldn't mind turning around, fold it up, and take it to the outside wall, and we'd appreciate that very much. Thank you.